<clears throat> oh, there they come, Gary. Whee! Hello! It's just like, let, woo! They all come flooding in. Let's see us. Let's have a look at the participantes. Oh, here they go. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Let me get my chat up so I can see you. Where are you tuning in from, people? this evening today for some people it'll be morning i wonder if sue langford's here in australia gary i know she registered I, so I tell us where no, no, no. oh go back chat wait, wait, no, no, no. expand expand hello from tonya howard to everyone hello from bermuda hello tonya hello tonya daughter's here i hope i've got that right from denmark Pam from Iowa, Marion from BC, Canada. Oh, there go so quickly. Shannon is Peterborough. Hello, Shannon. Barbara Dills. Uh, mm, no, come back. Barbara Dills was from, uh, oh, I don't know. Where, where have you gone now, Barbara? Oh, Carbondale. Michelle in the UK. Jill in Shropshire. Sue Lawrence from south of France. No, just in France. Sue, Sue in France. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jackie is in Shropshire. Hi, Jackie Pomeroy. Hi, Jackie. Jeanette from France. Uh, Judy's here from Manitoba in Canada. Teresa's here. Hello, hello, Sweden. Alison Allway from Malaga. As always, Alison. Ha, ha, ha. That was a little pun there. Tim is here. Hello, hello, Timmy. Uh, from Exeter, Susan from Wisconsin, USA, M Michelle Sites from California, Aaron Silla from US Kansas, and Trudy Dickinson. Trudy from the UK. Okay, now this one. This this um, webinar, Gary, um, we've had lots and lots of people register and lots of quite a lot of people tell me that they're not going to be able to make it just like they couldn't when it was on Easter weekend. But that's OK, because we can send them a recording. However, this time, only the people watching are going to get the offer. Got something about omg that's mean i know right so only <laughs> the people that are watching live are going to get our very special little offer which i'm going to tell you about in a minute jane is from malton in north yorkshire lynn cooper is from wales hello 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 hi from royal wooden bassett hello jeanette hi, says okay Shall we get into it? Shall we get into it? I'm going to share my screen because we're going to just get straight into it because we last time we did the webinar on the laminitis. How long did it go on for, Gary? It was nearly two hours. Two whole hours. <laughs> I have to say everybody was glued. The amount of people that started with the same amount of people that finished. So they're, they're hardened barefooters. That's what they are. Um, <laughs> Oh, Jane, Jane says it was fab. Um, <laughs> Michelle says she feels very special tonight. So you should. You should feel special. Jackie says we just love the band. <laughs> just, I tell you what, it might get a bit controversial this evening. It could get a bit controversial, but we'll see. Because diet, it's that thing, isn't it, Gary? Diet, diet, diet. Whenever we talk about diet to our clients, especially new clients, it's one of those things that we call it we call it the meat we call it the meatloaf thing don't we the meatloaf moment we do the meatloaf um i'll do anything for love but i won't do that <laughs> that's what we call it it's yeah, the diet it's thing it's the diet thing it's the meatloaf thing and it's the biggest thing that people really struggle to well, I, I, I shall say it now, but at the end, you're just going to have to learn to let go. Let go, my lovelies. Let, let it go. go. Let I'm it go. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> okay, let's let's get it. Amanda says, I watched it over a couple of evenings. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Pam Gore, I wish I had seen that webinar on laminitis. Pam, you can see Pam. it again. You can nip over to the website at schoolhmi.com and you'll see that in a moment written up on the screen 
And on our webinar page, we have the up and coming webinars, which we're going to add some more to soon because uh, we're running down and uh, all the pre-recorded ones, the on demand, you can register on demand and see it again, Pam, everybody can. I don't know how long it will be up there as long as we're allowed to keep the storage in Zoom, I suppose, <laughs> and they can stay. I don't care. Um, Angela Scott says hi from Vienne. Looking forward to learning how and where, Pam. It's on the website, Pam, on the website. Okay, thank you, thank you, she said. Let's get on with it. Oh, so much more. Right, I'm going to share my screen. La, la, la. Portion of the screen. I haven't got any video tonight, but I shall share any of that. Right, let's have a look where we are. Oh, there she blows. Can you see that, lovely people? Can it's all good. You, can, it's all good? I mean, let me it's put the good. chat box. Let me put my chat box up, though, because I, I can't see otherwise. Oh, there we go. Everybody give, can see that. Give us a thumbs up if in your part of the world or a big yes or a why, if you can see it. Marvellous. i just sort my glasses out a minute because I've got I've got something stuck on my face. That'll irritate me. Right. Horse and Hoof Care with HMIS instructors Lindsay Setchell and Gary Hinton. Ready, people. Uh, 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 nose. Are you ready? Give us a thumbs up. Ready, ready, ready to learn about diet. Come on. Come on. Yes, says Jeanette. Michelle gives us a thumbs up. Lynn Cooper says yes. Tonya says I was born ready. Joe Greenwell says yes. <laughs> Susan Knupel. I don't know how to say that. Susan Knupel. Susan Knupel says yes. Sue Lawrence. Yes. Angela. Yes. Jane Woodash. Yes, please. OK, let's do it. So. How to implement a species-specific diet for your horse, pony, or donkey. Now, this could open a whole massive can of worms. So we're going to keep it. No, actually, we're not, are we? We, no. we? we did actually say we were going to keep it very uncontroversial and probably just very basic. We lied. We're going to actually go into it. We are probably going to be quite controversial. All right. So without further ado, let's get into it. So our webinar aims for the, I love that picture of that horse. <laughs> our webinar in mid-chew. He's in mid-chew. Is this that? Hulu. Our webinar aims to understand what is meant by a species specific diet. How many people really understand that? How many people want to understand that? And this is what we found as we've gone through our journeys. We found that in actual fact, people aren't too keen on wanting to know whether it's species specific or not. Learn the difference between grass, hay and haylage. You're gonna know why fiber is the cornerstone of your horse's diet. You're going to discover the truth about sugar and carbs. Well, maybe a little bit of the truth. You're going to find out if you should be feeding supplements. <sighs> That's going to be specifically controversial. And you're going to learn the best way to feed your horse. We've got tons to pack in. And Gary and I are both going to present this evening. I'm going to do a little bit. Gary's going to do a little bit. And we're going to have a little bit of banter. So shall we dive straight in? Does anybody know what species specific actually means? What is species specific? What do we mean? What are we trying to say? Jeanette says be controversial. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> we will. What does species specific mean to you? It means, Michelle says it means only equine. Indeed. So we're talking about the species. Are we going to be feeding the horse? what we feed our cat and are we going to be feeding our cat what we feed our horse I don't think my cats would like it very much if I came with a pair of scissors and brought some hay from the barn and chopped up some hay into their little feeding bowl I'm pretty sure they would get very annoyed with me very soon and equally so with the dogs however if I took some sachets of my cats full of high protein meat out to the horses I think they'd be thinking I'd lost my mind. So species specific. Tonya says tailored specifically to the animal. Indeed. Uh, Joe says what they would eat naturally in the wild. Now, funny you should say that, Joe. Thank you for that, because that's exactly where we're going with this. But we're going to go in it in a kind of a roundabout way. 
because I want to know what natural predators the horse has in the wild. Can you tell me? Can anybody tell me what natural predators the horse would have in the wild? Why are we talking about predators, isn't it? No, Gary, give them a chance. Give them a chance. Humans. Yes, Pam. Naughty humans. Talk about them in a minute. Not all equines eat the same. Donkey's diet is different from the horse. Now, that's interesting you should say that, Alison. It is interesting you should say that. But everything that we say tonight is absolutely for donkey, for pony, for horse, and actually for zebra. If you had zebras living in your backyard, this would be the same for them too. And we will discuss that in more detail, Alison, but that was a really great thing for you to share. So Joe Green, Greenwell says they're frightened of their shadows. Quite, quite. Michelle says lions and big cats or otherwise known as cougars. There they are, the mountain lion, the cougar. Yes, that is one of the horse's natural predators. Anybody else got any other ideas? Gary, go on. Got any other ideas? Um, Susan's came up, come up with um, wolves. Oh, wolves. Um, and um, there is another one in some places, not all, um, and that's bears. Bears. All those things that have got big teeth, big claws, and like to eat horsey meat. So those are natural predators. And Pam did mention another of the horse's natural predators. And here he is. Here he is. This is, this is Barry. This is your cousin, Gary. He's called Barry. <laughs> and and he's, it, he's not really a predator, though. Look at him, bless him. He's just got a little bit lost. He's he doesn't know lost. where he is. He's got a bit lost in the, in the Great Basin. So we'll get, rid of, we'll get rid of Barry for the moment and we'll go back to our natural predators. OK, so we've got the bear. We've got the mountain lion or the cougar, and we've got the wolves. There's something very specific about these animals in particular. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about grass. Boom. There it is. Now, in the wild, where these horses come from, big open spaces, the grass that they eat is quite short and it's quite fibrous and it's not in it's un, in unlimited supply, but it's not lush. And horses have to travel to make sure that they get enough to eat because it's fibrous. It's short. It They have to go a long way to go and get it. It doesn't tend to look an awful lot like that, does it, Gary? No. And we know that it doesn't look a lot like that because of the predators that eat the horse. Because I don't know about you, Gary, but when was the last time that you saw a green bear or even a green cougar or maybe even a green wolf? Have you mm. seen those? Have you seen mm. those out there? Not even on cartoons, I don't think. No. <laughs> Why? Why don't we see green bears, green cougars and green wolves? They're like, where is she going with this? Where is she going? Why are we not seeing <laughs> green predators, folks? Because if horsey lived in a land that was full of green lush grass, then their predators are likely to be camouflaged to fit in with the green. But they're not. They also don't get horsey feed when they're out there in the wild. They don't get horsey feed. And horsey feed today, nowadays, Gary, is more re resembles, don't you think, breakfast cereal. Breakfast. It does, though, doesn't it? it How does. many other people think that some horse food resembles breakfast cereal? You could just, like, put a bit of it in your bowl, pour on some milk, and away you go. Some breakfast cereal, Tonya says, yep. It certainly does. Or even these Hamster. little critters here. Little hamsters. Little hamsters. They like to eat all sorts of interesting things. And a lot of the food that we feed horses nowadays tends to be quite hamster-esque. Would you not agree, Gary? I would. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to these. Uh, this species-specific that we're talking about here. And what else do they not have in the wild that we 
as humans would give our domestic horses what do you think what other things would they not have in the world ah, pellets supplements here they are lotions potions powders and pastes we have a plethora you've only got to google supplements equine supplements and watch your watch the amount of money go da, 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 and just look at the page on google and it will be absolutely covered in lotions potions powders and pastes all of these amazing array of things down what aisle in the agricultural store gary what aisle do we call it oh that will be the pink aisle that'll be the pink aisle you know the one the one in the agricultural store that you go down and you can buy pink electric fence posts you can buy pink wheelbarrows you can i mean i quite like pink you can buy pink poo pickers you can buy pink in pretty much every color and if you look at the equine supplements a lot of them have got pink on their labels too now, most farmers, if there's any farmers amongst us this evening, would go past the pink aisle like this <laughs> as they trot past and they get to the cow aisle. And in the cow aisle, they do have some lotions, potions, powders and paste, but not very many. They don't have a lot of it. And what they do have isn't that expensive. And it definitely isn't in fancy tubs with lots of pink writing on the with magic wands and all of that kind of thing, because it's like, I'm a farmer, do you mind? There's two different aisles right next to each other in the agricultural store. The pink one, and it's aimed specifically at certain people, i.e. us, us lovely equine owners. And then we have the cow aisle that's aimed at the farmers. And do you know what Gary and I do when we go to the agricultural store? What do we do, Gary? We go down the cow aisle. <laughs> we do, we do. We go down the cow aisle. Okay. We love the cow aisle. <laughs> we love the cow aisle. All right. So now the world, the world of the wild horse is a little bit more beige than it is in the domestic world. Now I know that all the animals that live in the domestic world aren't all green. I know that's a bit silly, but I'm kind of just trying to make a point that basically in the domestic world, everything is an awful lot more green. And there's a good reason for that because green is good for food. So in our horsey domestic world, we don't just have horses, we have cows, we have pigs, we have goats, we have sheep. In fact, we have lots of animals that we either want to take a product from, i.e. dairy, or we want to eat them. Not me. I can hold my hand up and say, not me, not me. But that is the way it is, right? And our, and our horse has come into that world, only we don't want to fatten up our horse and eat it. Well, they might want to in this country, actually. I'm in France at the moment, and they do, in fact, eat horse. I don't, and they don't see very much of it in the supermarket, but it is there, cheval, isn't it, Gary? It is. It is, but it's not it's not abundant, but it is it, there. It is. And and unfortunately, um, this is the same for the donkey. Our little modern donkey also lives in this environment, and so do the ponies. They all live in this environment and they are slightly different to the big horse. So a little pony is going to look different to a big horse just because it's changing in its shape, its, its, its traits and characteristics. And the donkey looks a little bit different because they've got bigger ears, but they're all part of the family Equidae and they're all under the genus Equus. The only thing that separates them is species. That's the only thing that separates them. And we only have seven species, five, six, seven species of equus left on the planet. Three zebras and, Gary, you can say it. Uh, two ass. Three. Is it three ass? Three. Um, that, and, you, can't, and you can't count. Bless him. The, uh, zebra, three ass. Uh, and the horse. And the oh, he, he got there. The that was amazing. The Did you see he got there? That was really good. Yes. Now, but in the domestic world, we've got plenty of horses. And the donkey actually isn't a species in its own right. It came from the wild ass Africanus. 
that's where the, they think that the donkey came from. But there they are, they're all living in this world and they don't have any natural predators, none at all. But they do have an awful lot of things that can cause them to have problems. And this is them. This is a very typical, very typical image of horses in our domestic world. In the, in the portions of paddocks, I call that a patchwork quilt. If you go around London and the M25, which obviously many of you aren't going to do because you tune in from all over the world. But when we drive around the M25, all around the M25, which is the peripheral road that runs around London, you just see these patchwork quilts everywhere. So these little squares that horses are put into on their own. So they can't they can't groom with other horses in very similar to this situation right here where they've got horses next to each other that can't touch they can look at each other they can smell each other but they can't touch and for prey animals and for these animals very specifically it's very important that they interact but this is not what this evening is about this evening is about diet but look at the difference where they live where the horses evolved wasn't particularly very bright green. Yes, yes, of course, we didn't have the green cougars and the green bears and the green wolves. It was just me trying to really ram home the difference between the green and the, the very beige looking environment that these animals came from. And in actual fact, Gary, them themselves are not really very bright green either, are they? They're not. They blend into their environment too, don't they? They do blend into their environment. Or, oh, well, they're meant to blend into their environment. Um, Alison says it looks like the south of Spain. Yeah. And in fact, it could be, couldn't it? Because that's very dry and very dusty. But you go to the UK and you go to somewhere like Cornwall, it looks like that. And in certain mm -hmm. places around the world, in Australia, in America, depending on where you go, it will look like this at certain times of the year, won't it? Sarah says, my comptoir is a meat bird. Yeah, yeah, comptoirs are the meat horses in France. They certainly are. Um, yeah, oh, it's all overwhelming junk. Right, now, Gary, you can take it from here if you like. Okay. So what do we mean by mixed species hay? Um, so mixed species, um, we want it to be as mixed as possible. So lots of varying different grasses. Now, depending on where you are in the world will depend on what grasses are available to you, whether they're warm, warm, warm grasses or cold grasses. Um, but there is one grass that can be a problem. Um, and what what do we think that that grass might be? Yeah, I haven't got a picture of that. <laughs> no, I mean, okay, that doesn't matter. Okay, yes, rye, absolutely. Um, I will find that. Rye grass is um, there's there's several different types, um, but basically they have even in their dried format in hay have three to six hundred times more sugar in it than mixed species hay. So that's really the one that you want to avoid. Now, Lindsay will find a picture of that for you. Um, and it's, I'm it's trying, I'm trying. Ooh, ooh. Oh, oh. There we go. go. Back, that's it. <laughs> Thank there you. There we go. <laughs> um, so, yes, you want it as mixed species as possible. Now we've got the, the fescue and the foxtail and we've got the timothy. Um, and there's, there's loads of them. And depending on your land um, or, where, or your farmer, will depend on what grows well. Um, you can mix in herbs if you want to, wildflowers, all of those things, um, and make it as mixed species as possible. Ideally, not sprayed with um, insecticides or pesticides. That's what mixed species hay is really. Now, rye, they see the picture of rye there, you well, like that that's that's we're going to say that that's as close as we as I can get we, to we a picture get, of yeah. rye. I'll, that I'll looks a bit like it. cooch grass, actually. But you can Google yeah. that and you can find what rye looks like. But it, it looks like that with the spiracles just going off flat, going away from the stem. Yeah. So you've got the stem going up the middle 
and then the the um the the the, the, the seeds the, the spherules come off um at a diagonal but if you were to turn it on its side rye is flat so it, it's it's you turn it on its side and it's it's really flat it's not all the way around the seeds aren't all the way around the stem um so you want to avoid that um a little bit of history um why is the, why why is far, rye used in farming so much there's a bit Do of a history lesson there's, there's a bit of a history lesson there um yes it's cheap um two uh, all, it, it's it's for cow prolific. farming it's cow farming. yeah for cow farming um it's prolific it grows you can get multiple crops out of it you but can. the main reason that we actually introduced rye in its mass quantities was back at the end of world war ii when everybody came home the people that were already living at home already had um there was always already rationing um and there wasn't enough food to go around and all of that so they ended up having to bring in a crop which was rye that was going to be able to create meat quicker and create more milk and because the war was over there was an abundance of a certain product which rye absolutely loves it does and that is nitrogen it's nitrogen fertilizer and of course that nitrogen and fertilizer is what all the bombs were made out of so instead of making bombs from it we stuck it all on the fields so you ended up getting three crops out of a year at least um and obviously all of that energy where the um that all of that energy is going into the cattle and the sheep and creating milk and meat in abundance to feed the millions. That's basically what happened. There it is. NPK but, is what it stands for. But um, that we, we haven't gone back. So that's why there is so much rye around. Um, racehorses um, are predominantly fed rye. And yep. people will tell you that rye is safe. Well, I'm going to tell you that it's not. Trust me, it is not. It's, it is almost, it can be done, particularly if you ask questions with your farmer. What seed was put down in the field? Don't go and ask, is there any rye in it? Because be clever be clever don't don't ask is there any rye in it because they'll say oh no we don't plant rye thank you very much <laughs> and then you get you get your bale of hay and then you end up and you open it up and then out of it's rye it's mixed species you want you want to ask questions be clever and say what is the seed mix that was planted in the field they they have to give you a specific answer um, and then if it has no rye in it that's probably the best that you can do because rye is everywhere and it does transport with the wind and all of those things but we want as minimal amount as possible it's very important hay can provide your horse with everything that it needs i don't know gary i'm going to play devil's advocate right now I don't believe you because hay looks dry and boring and I can't believe that a big animal that looks like that in the picture and my animals and even my little Shetlands, I can't believe they could survive on just eating hay. Is it possible? What do you think? Everybody watching, do you think that horses can survive on eating hay? Jackie says, what flowers, herbs are best to add to hay? <gasps> Ooh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a big answer. <laughs> it is, but but if you've got mixed species, Jackie, you're gonna get a whole. That's the whole purpose of the mixed species because it's meadow, so it's gonna have a whole array of flowers and herbs and all sorts of things in there. Jane says yes, it can. Shannon says, of course it can. I, she's, she's like, you're so stupid, Lindsay. Of course it can. Um, 
Um, <laughs> Jeanette says, of course they can. Wow. But Jeanette, isn't it interesting? Because so many people say that horses cannot live on hay alone. Um, Gail says it, it depends on the hay. Now, this is a good point, Gail, because if we just said, well, go and feed um, cereal hay or go and feed oat straw or go and feed barley grass or go and feed um, just Timothy on its own, because people recognize that Timothy isn't as high in sugar as rye. Just go, uh, go ahead and feed that. Do you think that that is something that is going to do the horse any good? If you feed the horse a single species of one particular grass, because that what is what it is, is that going to do it any good? No, it's not. It's not. And and we get ourselves so, so, yeah. Jackie says, no, needs to have variety. Who said that? Tonya said it's not balanced. Jeanette says mixed species. Yes, yes, yes. Variety is the key. It is. But in certain areas of the world, uh, Spain might be not too bad. France isn't too bad. But when you get to very, very hot and dry areas, it's not that easy to get lots of mixed species hay. And in that respect, then you're going to have to buy single species and try and mix it together. And that is when it can become a little bit complicated. But for the vast amount of equines that live around the world, if they can survive out in the Great Basin and they can survive in the in the uh, Eurasian steppe on very short, um, fibrous grasses, believe me when I tell you they can totally survive on good mixed meadow hay alone. That's it. Because it is incredibly important stuff. And hay needs to be the biggest, if not the only, part of their diet they don't need anything else you don't they don't sam says sorry miss loads couldn't log in but mine aren't mine aren't having anything except me hey since i did the course they're looking good well done sam hi sam yeah denise says what about getting a hay analysis well we haven't got time to go over that right now but hay analysis even if it's done correctly which often it rarely is isn't going to give you a full picture of what's going on. And at the end of the day, when we're out seeing lots and lots and lots of people and speaking to people over the internet and visiting loads of our clients, it's not feasible for everybody to go and do hay analysis and to get a really good, good picture of what's coming in from your hay supplier, which they're going to get this hay from different fields. You've got to be getting hay analysis from lots and lots and lots and lots of bales. And what's that hay analysis actually going to tell you? What that you've got a high sugar or a low sugar, water soluble, ethanol soluble. It's going to tell you what things are in it, but very few owners actually know how to react to that anyway. But what um, some supplement companies will do is that they will take a hay analysis, tell you what your horse might be lacking in, give you a balancer that they call it, or they'll give you a supplement to give to your horse. But those horses are all in, you could say one horse, another horse, all these horses, all with different people, all these different variables, all been given different treats, different pasture, different turnout, different stables, and they're all being given these supplements. When actual fact, or, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but in actual fact, all you need to do is source very good quality mixed species hay or get that mixed yourself, no rye, no clover for whoever, who, whoever, somebody else asked that earlier. And you'll find most of your problems will melt away, won't they, Gary? They will. Hay is the biggest problem. Hay is going to be, hay should be your um, uh, top of your priority list. It should, it should. Everything um, that everything, all of your energy, apart from keeping your horses happy and healthy, and to do that, you need to be sourcing good quality mixed meadow hay. Hundred percent. And actually, there are many, many owners out there who say that they can't. There are some that actually really struggle, genuinely. Yeah, but yeah. do you know something? Those are few and far between. The ones that actually. Um, can many can but many don't many people don't think they can survive on it either many people think that that is just a it's just an old wives tale but can i'm telling you now as hoof ex experts and of what we've seen over the years horse and hoof care experts believe us when we tell you 
that mixed species hay is the cornerstone of your horse's diet. But um, I heard the other day, I heard a story, Gary, about a pony that had been diagnosed with laminitis. It had been diagnosed with laminitis. And so the vet had actually told the owner to put it in a in a paddock away uh, in a uh, what people might call a dry lot. But they called it a diet paddock as a po it's, we know it as something else, don't we? We know it as the starvation paddock, which we'll talk about in a moment. But in it went. And the vet actually said, don't feed hay because hay is too starchy. Actually said, don't feed hay. So this horse that needs all this fiber, anyway, God, I nearly died. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, we need to move on. Let's move on. Okay, so hay should make up the majority of the horse's diet, um, if not all of it. Um, forage is not just a bulk. Horses are herbivores and need to spend a long time eating. And also with that, a long time eating, moving as well. Movement is equally as important. Hmm. So when, when we're feeding our hay, we don't want it in one place. We want it in multiple places, lots of different places, because that's what a horse would do in the wild. They would travel, they would forage, because they're not grazers. Horses aren't grazers. Horses are foragers. Cows are grazers. Um, and they spend a long time eating and moving and eating. And that's really good for the gut too. Um, so therefore they need to eat food that is energy and nutrient sparse because they eat so much of it. Yeah. How many hours a day does a horse sleep? Yeah, how many hours does how, a horse... How many hours a day does a horse sleep? And whilst I carry on, then we'll see what some of the... Because when they're not sleeping, they're either playing, resting, chewing on hedgerows, moving. Yeah, maybe maybe four hours, says Zara. Four, potentially. Laura says 45. Jackie says 20. Well, there's been um, the Brostrop project, which Pedder Fredrickson, Ingvar Fredrickson, that's his dad, um, and um, 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 Hoofbeats, which was, um, I think it was Hoofbeats, which was a company that had developed a sensor that went around the horse's head. So they had all these horses that they turned out, these youngsters into 70 acres. And it's the biggest piece of research we've ever had on what horses just do day to day. It's like a massive amount of research data points that we've never had before. And we find that horses have this REM sleep that's where they're completely flat out and they do it for around about an hour a day maybe not even that it depends sometimes it's a lot less than that and they do it in little chunks they don't do it all at once they do it in little chunks and then they can stand and rest as you well know um because they they can they've got um they're able to lock the stifles they're able to not use any muscle energy to stand there and just rest and that's for another couple of hours split through the day. And the rest of it is mostly eating. Occasional bit of moving on, occasional bit of play, but really it's mostly eating. So when they're eating and they're eating constantly, so many and many, many hours a day, they don't need uh, foods that are energy rich. They yeah. don't need foods that are nutrient rich. The nutrients are there, but they're consuming so much. It doesn't need to be in abundance. So their digestive system is designed for continuous fiber throughput. Now, um, when I first started um, uh, keeping horses, I was told that my horse needed to poop to be healthy eight times a day. And I thought, oh, well, that's, that's really interesting. So there was me 
a young novice out there and there I was had a few horses and was counting the poos each day to make sure that there was enough poos and there was enough, <laughs> I can enough just things going, going through going through the digestive tract and then I learned about species specific diet and then I put my horses on a hay only diet because I had problems with my horses and how many poos do you think a horse should poo a day? <laughs> now, you could go old, what I was told years ago, or what we know now, and stick old and new, 14 to 20. Susan, can you pull? I love that name, can you pull? I don't know how to say that. She says 14 to 20, Adele says 12 at least. Um, I'm sure Jill just said three to four, but I'm thinking she's still she's still talking about the the, the sleeping. I think Sue says every Sue. they should poo every four hours. I yeah. love every four hours. I've heard eleven. Go on then, put us out of our misery, Gary. Well, it's gone from eight up to sixteen or more when they're on a fiber diet. And they're good so, round poos. If we're going to get into and poos. they're good round poos. An actual fact, and when they when they drop out, they're not actually that wet, and they're almost it, it, it's it's almost criminal because you think, oh my god, I've spent all this money on the hay, and then it comes out the other end and it still looks like hay. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, pooing gold dust. Absolutely, they do. Uh, Jill says, add an extra one when you are in poo picking, just for good measure, of course. Of course, just while you're poo picking, they'll just go, hang on a minute, Joe. I'll just give you one that extra. Fiber throughput into the gut is so important. But when they're just on green grass, there is no fiber. We're going to go into um, uh, structural, non structural carbohydrates. Lindsay's going to cover that to death in a minute. <laughs> I am. So, horse, well, horse, will, horse. <laughs> <laughs> horses not eating enough hay or haylage will lose weight and they will they will high fiber diet promotes good regular bowel movements well we've already said that haven't we we have too little fiber leads to an accumulation of gas which can lead to colic fiber keeps the gut and the horse healthy too little fiber can contribute contribute to gastric ulcers as not enough saliva <clears throat> is produced with, and the saliva is rich in bicarbonate and aids as a buffering agent now if we think about though have you thought um we've all seen um horses teeth yeah um and those molar arcades at the back they're massive aren't they yes those massive molar arcades are there for chewing. Now, if you get some young, sweet, short, lowland grass and stick it in your mouth and chew it up, it disintegrates in seconds. I remember doing that when I was a kid. Still do it now. Yep. <laughs> and then you grab a few pieces of hay, stick that in your gob and try and chew that down. Oh no, my God, it takes ages. And then whilst they're chewing, that increases the saliva, which is rich in bicarb. And also the fiber helps to also, when it gets into the stomach, neutralize that stomach acid. Because horses create stomach acid all of the time. All the time. And some people don't like that, don't know that. Humans don't. Humans, our, 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 our stomach acid kicks in through us eating. Um, and then when we stop eating and it settles down, then the stomach acid really slows down. So we don't have that, that, that mechanism. So another reason for fiber, 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 fiber for your horses. But not out of a bag. <laughs> But surely, Gary, come on now. If it says high fibre on the bag, how much do I feed? What do I feed? Should I just feed what it says on the bag? Surely if it does say high fibre, it's going to be okay. Is that what we should be feeding? 
No. And also, no. Um, uh, let's talk. Uh, uh, everybody's in. Uh, everybody can have different financial situations, yes. can't they? Yeah. Um, bagged feed costs money. It does a lot. A lot of money, and and forget about your bagged feed, and buy hay. <laughs> for, 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 it's controversial for, controversial for your money for your money you will get a whole lot more for your money if you put your money into hay and not in a 20 kilo bag of poor amanda just said her, she's very she's very concerned she wants to know how many droppings should they be doing because her internet dropped out for a while <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's 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 about sixteen to twenty. Yeah, if, a lot. If, if and they will only produce that. They will only produce that if they are on a mainly fiber diet. That's right. Indeed, it yes. is. If if they're getting too much grass, the the short sugary stuff that is is not high in fiber. There's nothing that you can do. No. And let's just very briefly also say about those big uh, molar arcades. They when a horse is put onto short grass, which a lot of um, owners think that that's OK. Let's there's hardly any grass out there. They out they go. And these horses are nibbling away. Do you think they're putting those big molar arcades to work? Do you think they're really working hard? And some horses don't have hay all through the summer. From spring right through, they don't have any hay. Some horses only have hay in the stable at night, perhaps, or in the day, depending on whether they're turned out. So there are an awful lot of horses that are going through a great portion of the year with very little amount of hay. And some horses don't get it much all year round, too. What do you think is happening to those molar arcades? What do you think is, is actually happening to those teeth that have nothing to grind down, really? Not much at all, because those horses need the fibre. And it isn't just about that. It's not just about the teeth. The whole gastrointestinal tract, from mouth right back to when they're pooing out those 16-odd poos a day, all of that... All of that needs the right kind of fibre. Otherwise, it ain't going to work properly and you're going to get problems. And those are problems you can't see necessarily. And those are problems that a lot of people think are behavioural issues or that they're tacking up issues. They don't realise that this is down to the fact that that horse's gastrointestinal tract is not getting enough fibre. Let's have a quick look at some questions. Um, Michelle says it's difficult when at a livery yard my horses are out about 12 hours a day and we're not allowed to put out hair. I know, Michelle, it's a nightmare because those bacteria that need that in the hind gut are waiting for that fibre. And we've got different versions of bacteria that this whole diversity, this microbiota going on in the gut. And they're and it's it's like feast and famine. One minute they're giving a load of fibre, next minute they're not. When they're giving a load of fibre, next minute they're not. And equally, on the times when they're not giving fibre, they're giving a bit too much sugar. But hey, 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 let's move on a little bit quicker because we're going to not get it all done. Right, Gary, carry on. What about haylage, Gary? Because so many people say, what about haylage? Wrapped hay, right? Yes. So um, what are the differences? Let, let's have a look at some of the differences. <clears throat> so hay has a water content which is below 20 percent um obviously hay is much drier typically haylage is uh got a water content of 30 to 50 percent um i think we've all seen farmers but when they judge the weather wrong they wanted hay and then they think oh balls i didn't get <laughs> didn't get out there oh didn't get out there in time oh my goodness, it looks as though it's going to have to be haylage today because it's not quite dry enough. Um, so, th so that is haylage. Um, so um, then we've got um, hay is dry enough to be protected from decay. Um, haylage is not dry enough, so it has to be wrapped. 
And when I when I saw that when when we were talking about that, Lindsay, I'm thinking when we went, we had a, a quick trip down to the pub, and we saw that haylage being wrapped in France, didn't we? Oh, wasn't that amazing? Oh God, yeah. They they wrap it in really big long lines. They don't do individual. I mean, they do do individual balls, balls, bots, some farmers, but but these elephant legs we'd seen. We've I've lived here for nearly six years. Is it nearly six years? Something like that. Yeah, six. Yeah. yeah. And I've never seen how they make those elephant legs. Me and the kids used to think that they came from outer space. These great big long lines that look like caterpillars, actually, don't they? Rather than elephant legs, they look like caterpillars that are just this. There must be about sometimes thirty odd round bales all lined yeah, up all next more, to each other, all, all wrapped. More. Yeah, all wrapped. and they're all wrapped together, so they're not individual. It's just one great big long sausage. Um, That's right. So with hay, um, no fermentation needs to take place. Haylage, obviously, the fermentation does need to take place. So that's when it actually heats up inside um, and there's a chemical reaction that goes on that helps to preserve the, the hay that is inside. Um, and that takes um, many weeks. Um, uh, then we've got um, hay is typically higher in sugar. Now this is very often what people find really surprising. They do. They think it's the other way around, don't they? Yes, because haylage smells so sweet, but it's part of the fermentation process. If you've got a field of hay and half of it is made for hay and you've got half of it that's made for haylage, so exactly the same species and it's, it's all done at the same time, it's just one is wrapped and one isn't, the hay will have a slightly higher sugar content. And it stays pretty much consistent too, from and, when and it's it cut. Stays consistent. It yeah, doesn't yeah, tend it, to change. It, it doesn't change <clears> much. No, because there's because it's not wrapped, there's no anaerobic fermentation going on with the bacteria. Yeah. And so therefore it tends to stay ve pretty much constant. So people, when they say, oh, I fed last year's hay, old hay, um, thinking that that will be lower in a um, sugar content, it's not correct. What it will be is dustier and yeah. it will be potentially um, might have even have spores in it. So old hay isn't necessarily going to be good hay uh, because of the difference between hay and haylage. And the difference also between hay and haylage means that you can't feed wrapped hay, can you, Gary, straight away? You can't. No, no. You have to leave it you to do to this wait. fermentate. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens with bacteria when they're fermenting? There's a, there's a, a time limit on this because as they ferment, they produce acids and that's what you can often smell. And, and, and as they're fermenting and they're using up those sugars because they're respiring, they're anaerobic, they're not using oxygen because that's all been used up. So they're producing this acid and the more acid they, they produce, it starts to drop the pH in that wrapped haylage. Now it'll keep on going till it hits a point when they go, oh, Oh, I can't survive actually in a pH lower and lower than that. It's too acidic. I'm going to die off. I'm going to stop. It's the fermentation just stops. So there's a process of the sugars being used up that's making the sugars and dropping the pH. And once the pH gets to a certain level, it just stops the fermentation because the bacteria can't live in that level. Now, if that halage is split, broken apart, oxygen now gets in. Aha! Now we've got aerobic bacteria that are going to join the party and they also can cause issues because they can then continue to lower the uh, the, the ph level and then you can start to have things where haylage will start to go off if you're not careful and that can be a problem and it can be a problem for the for the gut because if the ph is low in the haylage chances are follows doesn't it the ph is going to get lowered more than it should in the gut because bacteria love ph to be at a nice set level, just a below neutral, just a little bit acidic. Some like them a little bit more alkaline, but generally just a bit low, lower than, than neutral. So it's important to allow that haylage to, 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 to do its fermentation process. But there's an issue as well, isn't there, Gary, with haylage? Because 
we've got positive. very good we, we've got good positives and we've got some negatives too um so um with hay the harvest uh, uh, they harvest later so there's less nutrients but with haylage they tend to harvest earlier with higher nutrients uh -huh. I, I think also also i think also it's worth saying that um a lot of people would be here thinking, well, surely haylage is perhaps better and easier to feed for horses then. But it does come with its, its own problems um, because haylage is a very palatable, uh -huh. very palatable. So horses can tend to get through a whole lot more haylage than they would hay. That's so right. if, if there was a gold standard, it would be the best quality hay possible. Yeah, it would um, be. But there are there are occasions where haylage and and you you know, Lynn, you 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 fed hay um, wrapped hay um, um, for many years when when you were in the UK because um, I didn't have anywhere to store the hay, did I? I didn't have. That's and right, then Lots yeah, of people yeah. don't have anywhere yeah. to store and, hay. And lots, yeah. lots of people don't have anywhere. Um, uh -huh. And for people that maybe have um, horses with. Um, respiratory problems um then with haylage that 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 comes with its own um pluses because um there's there's no dust um that's right so that can really help so both have their place but if the horse is happy healthy and nothing's going wrong or anything like that hay is the go-to hay is the it go is and joe says is it important um, is it important then, then as to the time of day the hay is cut to reduce the amount of sugar? Well, oh God, you know something? This is a this is a this is a million dollar question because there are so many variables in haymaking, and you can't get it specifically right every time, every day, every year, every season. It changes so much because of the temperature, because of the weather because of the type of plant, because of also the fact that how much sun you're going to get, how much it's grown, and when it's cut, how long have they got to allow it to dry? If it's going to be haylage, are they going to wrap it sooner? It, there's so many variables involved in that. It would be lovely, wouldn't it, to just say, yes, there's a time of day that's going to make it, to, to, that's, that's you know, that's going to mean that there's less sugar in it. But in actual fact, the research that's been done, that it just goes to show that they're just, there's, there are just too many variables in any one situation. What they have found is that when they have done research on grasses, is that, um, and this is not hay we're talking about at the moment, but grasses, but seeing as you've brought it up, I might as well say it, is that it, we all used to think, didn't we, that, that, the sunnier part of the day is going to be the day there's going to be the part where the horses go up uh, the horse stop saying horse where the grass is going to be photosynthesizing and producing that sugar and then in the in the sort of non-sunny parts of the day the the plant as the as it gets darker and it loses that light it's going to start respiring and using up that sugar for the processes that it needs to grow so we were always told let your horse out at night um or or let it out early in the morning or later on in the afternoon but bring it in over the hotter times of the day or the sunnier times of the day when in actual fact the research that's been out there is some say yes and others say no there's no right answer and some plants show absolutely hardly any difference at any time of the day others show a tiny bit of difference not as much as we all thought and it's a really i it, didn't catch that stop could it, you try stop it Siri. and it's a really bad way of of managing grass intake by saying oh i'll let them out a little bit in the morning or oh i'll let them out overnight or oh i'll let because we found that in actual fact there isn't the difference that you think there is what's out there in the morning and then during the night and in the afternoon can be just as lethal as what's out there at lunchtime because the difference isn't that great i was slightly going off track there sorry about that so gary should we starve them should that pony be without hay absolutely not 
they need that constant fiber throughput. And we've mentioned some of those reasons already because that gut needs to be kept moving. It kept, needs to be kept going. It doesn't need to be empty. Um, so what is starvation syndrome? Now, starvation syndrome can happen when, and, and I'm sure there's people on this call that are on this webinar that um, think that if I gave my horse free access to mixed meadow hay, they would gorge themselves. Mm. Um, and I'm not going to lie, that sometimes can happen. Mm -hmm. But starvation syndrome is not a, a, a it's not a bodily problem. It's a psychological problem mm -hmm. because horses have been inadvertently micromanaged with their gut, with their diet and in their head, they're always hungry. They've never had that fiber throughput for long enough for them to realize that it's not going to run out. So starvation syndrome is that horse that is going to gorge itself but it should never run out of that fibrous forage and give it a few weeks to a few months and each horse is different without that hay running out all of a sudden the horse's brain will click and it will just manage itself and take what it needs imagine Starvation that horse sick. yeah, yeah. and imagine but, that horse gary that's 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 on that very short grass all summer yeah and then they go then in the winter they're allowed hay and then they gorge on it and um, what hay are they and what hay are they given in the winter are they given just a hay net yeah and is it enough no how many horses it, run out of their hay net overnight indeed indeed they should so you'd have say access to hay all of the time. If, there, if there's one thing that we can change for horse welfare right now, right now, that could be easily done is every horse should have access to hay. Free access. 24-7. 24-7. 365. Absolutely. 100%. It, it is the cornerstone of it their diet. It it's so important. Um, Give them as much as they will eat. And like I said, if, if you've got a, um, a, a, a horse that is suffering from starvation syndrome, yes, they will eat a lot and more than you expect. And they will probably put on weight and they're probably fat already. But <laughs> it will balance out, probably. It will, it's, they will, it will balance out. But you've got to Trust have us. movement in there too, haven't you, Gary? You've got movement, to have movement in yes, there. Yes, yes. So once they know that the hay is not going to run out, they will settle down into eating and what they require. Feed on the ground mainly. Um, the, the way that the horse's mouth is, we, we know horses um, forage, um, but the main part of their diet, they need to have their head down to um, pick um, and the, have their teeth in the right position to be able to pick and chew. Um, we know that their horses love to um, hedgerow brows and pick off trees and all of that. That's great too, but mainly the hay should be available on the ground. And above all, avoid founder traps. Um, and all, what are founder traps? Lush green grass. And Absolutely. also you, you, you have to remember um, that you are feeding the bacteria, the gut bacteria in the fore and the hind gut. then the bacteria are processing that fibrous forage, what's gone into the gut, to then supply everything that that horse needs. That bacteria and that bacteria being stable is the biggest thing that we want for horses. And Absolutely. the best way to get that, the best way to get that, is to get the best hay you can afford and as much of it as your horse can eat. Absolutely. Jo Pam, Pam said, we call it silage for cows. It's I've heard, I've always heard not to feed it to horses. Also, some people 
feed round bales of corn stalks during the winter so that horses keep their stomachs moving and not constantly eating hay, which has become very expensive. I don't think it's good, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, well, there we've got a situation, haven't we? What the horse needs, but what the horse can't get. And this is a this is a really big problem. And therefore, we are going to if we don't search for what they need, we're going to have issues. Now, the whole silage thing, Pam. Yeah, we've got the in, in Europe. It's called silage, too. And it's, it's to do with the moisture content. When you've got moisture, a lot of moisture above 60%, in fact, um, 50 to 60% when it's quite damp and then they cover it up. That's what we um, term as silage here. Haylage is when the moisture content is lower than that, but isn't as, as um, isn't as dry as hay. So um, it, it you're right, don't feed silage to horses. That's a bad thing to do. Cows will tolerate it far more than horses do. And that's because of the way that their guts are set out, because cows have four, four stomachs and horses are monogastric herbivores. In other words, they've got a stomach set up or a gastrointestinal tract similar to ours, except for when you get to the hindgut, because they've got something that we haven't got in their hindgut. So without further ado, shall we shall we gallop into, into that, Gary? All right, everybody, everybody's going to have to be very studious now. We've kept you going for ages and now you're going to have to really, <laughs> I'm going to whiz through sugar and carbs. What is the difference between sugar and carbs? Come on, tell me, put, put a message in the, in the chat. What is the difference between sugar and carbs? Sugar, 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 sugar. We hear it, hear it, hear it. Don't feed your horse sugar. It's terrible. Don't feed it sugar awful it will die it mustn't have sugar stop feeding sugar fructose just let's throw some words out there jill come on let's throw some o's words out there glucose fructose same oh susan's on it susan knuppel I'm, i know i'm saying it wrong susan i can't help it it's actually quite funny now i'm getting it completely wrong <laughs> complex carbohydrates jill's got another word out there she's got two words complex carbohydrates she's loving it she's she's picking them up. are you googling that jill right now are you googling and just jumping in there okay so sugar and carbs no way adele says it's the same yes well basically carbohydrate is actually the name carbs are turned into sugar well well done jane Jackie Pomeroy says carbs are complex molecules which are broken down into sugar. Well, in fact, carbohydrates are all of it. Carbohydrates are basically made up of three things. They're made up of the sugar part. And, the, and when we say the sugar part, that's because we tend to call those the simple sugars. Those are the ones that aren't those big long chains. Those are the ones that are are. Um, are in chains of ones and well, in a chain is not in a chain if they're one, but they may be in two. So you've got carbohydrates that are a mono, and you've got di, and then you've got poly, um, and the poly ones, the ones that are lots and lots of chains of sugar molecules that are all attached together, and those are the ones that make the longer chains. And those are slightly harder to break down, and in fact, some are incredibly hard to break down. But the sugars, the simple sugars. Those are quite easy to break down and that happens in different parts of the gut. So we have sugar, we have starch and we have fiber. And those are the three main things. So let's have a quick whiz through those. So sugar, starch and fiber are three main things that make up the big term carbohydrate. Well, in sugars, we've got the simple sugars. You've all heard of glucose. Have you all heard of glucose out there? Everybody knows what glucose is called. And then you've got, um, um, it's also known as um, uh, um, hextrose, isn't it, as well? I think it's also known as that. So glucose and fructose, fructose is another form, is another, it's not glucose, it's slightly different, it's, just, it's made up slightly different. And if you combine glucose and fructose and you put the two together, that's what makes sucrose. Now, these are what we call simple sugars. And the horse can get quite a lot of these simple sugars from grass and especially fresh green growing grass they're going to get an awful lot of these simple sugars rather than up the other end of the spectrum which is fiber okay so what is starch then so starch is basically a storage compound it's when the plant is gone oh 
I've just all day made loads and loads of sugar. This is really cool. I've made loads of it. I don't really need it right now because I'm, I'm not quite, I'm only tiny. I'm going to keep growing. So I need to, keep, to get that sugar and I need to make it into storage. I'm going to put it in storage and it's, and it's, that's what we call starch. It's a storage compound. So that's the difference. It takes the glucose molecules, there's lots of them together and they're storing it and they can store it in different parts of the plant. One of the main areas, of course, is in the, is in the, is in the roots underground that we can store starch there. We can also store it in different parts of the plant as well, not just underground. So what about the fiber? Well, the fiber and starch can be seen as a fiber in itself because of the fact that it is a long chain carbohydrate. But the fiber is really what we're talking about when we're talking about fiber. We're talking about the things that make up the cell wall. In humans, we have cell membranes. In plants, they have a cell membrane, but what plants have that humans don't have is they have cell walls. And that's because they, they are very much more regular shape, shaped cells in plants. And they are shaped like that because they're like building blocks. And that enables the horse to get the horse, I said it again. That enables the plant to get structure. And those fibers that we're talking about are things like cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And these are the ones that cannot be broken down in the foregut. They can't be broken down there. So it has to be broken down in the hindgut. And the horse can get energy from that. They can get energy from the simple sugars, and they can get energy from some of the starch that's broken down in the, in the, in the foregut too. But really, they want to get energy from the stuff that's broken down in the hindgut by the mi microbes because that, my friends, is safe energy. Because if they break down the sugars in the foregut because it's taking too much in and it's far too much of it, that spikes the blood sugar. That causes the horse to put on weight because once there's too much in the system, they're going to start turning it into fat and that's going to get stored around the body. And the fiber part of it, that's broken down in a different way because the microbes do that. And they are producing what we call volatile fatty acids. You don't need to know any of that, but that is kind of like a safe energy. It's not going to spike the blood sugar levels. It's not going to do that. And this is where the horse gets its true energy from. So it's actual fact. Horses need sugars. They need carbohydrates. If they didn't have it, they wouldn't have any energy. So they need to eat plants. Plants are incredibly amazing because from the plants, they get the carbohydrates. They get the proteins. They get the vitamins. They get the, 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 the macro and the micro. They get the fats even. And people don't believe it, but it's true. It's where the animals that we eat I don't. But the animals that eat that humans eat for meat, where do you think they make the meat from? They eat plants, right? That we're just we're just eating the middleman. Humans are eating the middleman. It all comes from plants and they can survive on plants very nicely. Thank you. The trouble is at what stage of growth that plant is at is going to determine how much sugar and carbohydrates or how much carbohydrate, shall we say, that that horse is going to take in, in what form. The, the taller the plant gets, the more fiber it's going to need, the more cellulose, because it's going to have more cell walls. It's going to keep it more upright so it doesn't fall over in the wind. The more fiber, that fiber can't be broken down in the foregut, has to go to the hindgut, and the microbes do their thing in the hindgut. Did I go too fast? Did I go galloping along that too quickly? No, says Joe. No, no, you didn't go too fast. No, says Jeanette. I got it. Please, please let that be a no, which is a positive no. Can we have positive no's? <laughs> <laughs> no with a plus sign. <laughs> no, with, yes. No, no, I'm confused. Yes, Joe said no, now she's saying yes, but I don't know. Okay, let's move on. So excess sugar causes weight gain. The sugar. Remember the sugar part of it. Let's call the sugars the simple sugars, the monos, the dyes. Let's call them those. And the plant has lots of those when it's growing. Um, that was very understandable. Thank you. I am whizzing through it because I'm very conscious of the fact that we're running out of time. So excess of that causes weight gain. It causes a blood sugar spike. 
We know that most, well, we know that horses full stop are insulin resist resistant to a point. Horses were never designed to have a lot of those simple sugars being broken down in the foregut, in their body, spiking that blood sugar constantly, 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 causing all kinds of problems. And we get it in excess because it can't stop eating it because horses aren't pigs, incidentally. They're not greedy pigs. They are just programmed to eat because they're massive animals and they're programmed to eat a lot of plant material to keep their size so it's not that they're pigs it's not that they're greedy it's just that that's how they're programmed to eat and if you give them the wrong kind of carbohydrate they're gonna get fat and we have a massive problem with overweight horses in the domestic world today very very big problem and one of the main reasons for that is grass um rapid fermentation changes the balance of the gut the other problem you've got is when they're taking in too much of this, too much and high quantities of this sugar, it can't, the foregut can't cope. It's like, no, the enzymes in the foregut have gone mental. They're like, no, I can't cope. I'm trying to break all these sugars that get, put it through the gut wall, get it into the body and there's more coming in, help, help. So a lot of it floods to the hind gut so it's not just fiber getting into the hind gut you've got simple sugars getting into the hind gut you've got starch getting into the hind gut and this then causes the microbes to do all sorts of funny things and it changes the ph and it changes the microbe by by microbe biodiversity in the gut that microbiota which we're trying to keep lovely and balanced is now going ah! Okay. Ah, okay. And it's it's at war with itself all the time, especially horses that are on grass, then hay, then grass, then hay, then grass, 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 bit of hay, grass, more grass, more grass, a little bit more hay, tiny bit of hay, not any hay anymore. Grass, 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 bag feed. Let's stick some bag feed in there as well. Ah, where's it all going to get digested? Now, if you're feeding your horse bag feeds, where? Is that being digested? That's what you've got to find out. That's what you've got to know because it's important that you know that. So in the foregut, that's the front end of the digestive system, the glucose, some of the starch, fructose, sucrose, those are all the things that can be processed in that part of the factory and then goes through the gut wall, spikes the blood sugar, and that's the stuff that a lot of horses are subject to eating most of the time. And it's a problem because guess what breaks those down? I, I did allude to it a minute ago, but what I did actually say it, if for those of you who were listening, what breaks those um, molecules down in the foregut? There's a specific kind of protein, no, Jeanette, the bacteria in the hindgut, they're breaking stuff down in the hindgut. There's a specific kind of protein. It's a very, very clever protein. Um, proteins are just amazing molecules anyway, amazing macromolecules. Yes, says Jackie Poro, it's enzymes. Did you know that horses haven't got the same amount in abundance of enzymes that humans have? Did you know that? Our foregut is a little bit more advanced, if you like, but their hindgut is more advanced than ours. So we're kind of like fighting for the who's got the better gut syndrome here. But the foregut of the human, we've got lots and lots of enzymes. It starts way up in the mouth, in the saliva. Horses don't have enzymes in their saliva. They don't have that amylase. That's more of a buffer, helping that food go down. Then it, the mastication's chewing it up. It's getting it going. We've got enzymes all the way through, right into our foregut. We break all that down. Away it goes. Horses don't have the same amount of enzymes. So the problem is you overload the foregut. You haven't got the manpower, the enzyme manpower in there to break it all down. And then that becomes a problem because it will flood the hindgut. And that's when rapid fermentation takes place. That's when the pH drops. Remember when I was talking about haylage? And when the pH drops, it causes a load of deaths in the microbes. Those are toxic. They get into the system. And we know that's what causes laminitis and inflammatory processes throughout the body. And then you've got a whole host of problems because you've also got things like leaky gut going on. And those horses that aren't allowed, hey, 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 they're only allowed a little bit of grass, 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 and not so much hay, guess what they've got going on too? They've got ulcers. 
because they've not got enough fiber going through their gut. I'll look at your questions in a minute. So what goes on in the hindgut then? Well, in the hindgut, all of that fiber, those big fiber molecules that we were talking about uh, a minute ago, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, those all go woo into the hindgut because they cannot be broken down in the foregut. So it bypasses the foregut. Enzymes cannot break it down. It goes shooting off into the hindgut. And that is where the microbes are all sat there hanging around going, bring it on, bring on the fiber, bring on the fiber so I can break that fiber down and I will produce for you, my lovely horse that I live in, the things that you need to survive. And those are the volatile fatty acids, which you can make all your energy out of. That is incredible. And the starch, we can do that with starch too, but don't give us too much. Don't overload us with the starch because that'll be a problem too. And then we have funny special molecules called fructans. Now, fructans, they are a special kind of fiber. They don't really fit in any sort of category. They're a bit like starch because they're a bit like a storage compound. They're also a bit like a fiber because they are like a fiber because they're a long chain carbohydrate, but they're not quite any of those things. They're a bit of a phenomenon. And those fructans, it's, it's debatable what they do in the hindgut and how much can be broken down, if any. But there are some scientists that say yes, and there are some scientists that say no. But what I can tell you is that, that what they know about the microbes in the gut, they know more about the surface of Mars. So that should tell you something. Never say never. It is a very interesting place, that place inside the gut. Right, very quickly, let me look at some of those. Da, 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 da. Are you watching those comments, Gary? Um, bum, bum, bum. I've been answering. People have been doing some question and answers. So I've been I've been busy in the Q&A's helping people whilst they're listening to your very in, in, uh, uh, interesting sugar and carbs whiz through so i've ignored i've been ignoring i'll let you that. carry on then i'm going to carry on you lot you lot just carry on chatting with gary and i'm just going to to carry on so let's get to probably the most controversial part of this webinar we are going to talk about the big s word and taint sugar it's something else beginning with s u it's s u s u super u it is the supplements supplements do you remember when we told you at the very beginning if you were watching at the beginning that we had meatloaf people what did we say those meatloaf people were gary i'll do anything for love but i won't do that <laughs> yes now women i am a woman i feel that i am a woman i feel that i can say this as a woman as part of my fellow womanage i feel i can say this <laughs> We have been a nightmare in feeding equines, but what's good about us is that we're also at the forefront of turning it round as well, because not only have we made it bad, we're trying to now make it better, because there's an awful lot of us out there that now realise we've made it bad, and now we need to make it better. Why do I pick on women? Well, I'll tell you why I pick on women. Um, as a hoof care professional, as well as a everything else professional, when we go out into the field, the majority of our clients actually are female. We do see men, we do see quite a few men, but not anywhere near as many as men as we see women. And if I go to a, a man and I say to that man who owns his horse, right, you actually don't need to be feeding this bag feed. All you need to do is feed your horse good mixed meadow species hay, and you don't need to actually feed it anything else. Well, I don't need to feed it this lotion, potion, paste and, um, uh, and and powder, no. And do you need to, do I need to feed it this very expensive bag feed? No, the man does this. Yes, I am so relieved. I do not need to spend money on that horse, more money than I need to, fabulous, marvelous. They are easy, they're the easiest clients to have men. I love having men as clients, brilliant, marvelous. You don't need to do that. I'll do anything you say, Lindsay, it's marvellous. Is it saving me money? It's saving me money? Fantastic, fantastic. Women, we are a completely different breed. If I have the exact same conversation with a lady and I say, 
you really don't need to be feeding all of this. You don't need to be feeding all of that. Let's just strip it all out and let's just give it hay just for six months. Let's see how it goes. Horse is overweight anyway. So let's just see how it goes. I get this as a response. Mm. Mm. What, all of it? I mean, they like they like to have like at least one or two buckets a day just because they like it. Do they like it or do you like it? No, they love it. And um, and, I, and I don't think that a horse will get everything it needs out of all that hay that you're telling me to feed it. And, and, and I don't, I just don't, mm, and they struggle. Oh my goodness, they struggle. And I know by just looking at those comments that there are going to be more women in here tonight than there are men. There, there are some men, but there are more women than men. And most of the women here will be going through cold turkey and sweating up <laughs> at the thought of Lindsay telling them to stop feeding all their extra supplements. Because what we are doing to horses is we are hype giving them hyper nutrition. It is hyper supplementation. The world has gone mad, absolutely mad. And it is the biggest growing part of the equine world today are equine supplements. There are pharmaceutical companies who are going, I ain't going to spend all my money making all those drugs. We're getting on the supplement bandwagon because if we get on the supplement bandwagon, we can sell them because we don't need to have them checked. Now, that's something we're going to talk about in a minute. However, let's move on. So what defines a supplement? Well, an equine supplement is basically a complementary feedstuff. That basically goes above and beyond anything that that horse needs to survive. So a complementary feeding stuff is anything, anything that is fed to a horse in addition to a natural diet of forage. Hay, we said it was the cornerstone. That is what it needs to survive. If you don't feed it hay, OK, some people will feed horses, many feed, feed grass and the horse will survive on grass but it won't be at its optimum i can absolutely guarantee you that right now and so many so many owners think that they get used to the lower level of the way that that horse is performing not realizing that a horse can perform up here because they've never given it the opportunity to perform up here because they've never actually fed it what it needs it needs hay to survive grass it will survive on but it isn't what it needs to survive it needs fiber which is how in the domestic world, it needs fiber, okay? So if you feeding enough of this up here, that horse is getting everything it needs. If you're not doing that and you're giving it a bit of grass and then you might give it a bit of hay and then you've got some bag feeds you got from the agricultural store. And then as you went down the agricultural store, you saw rows and rows of all these tubs and bottles and they're all feeding different, doing different things for different parts of the body. And you're like, mm, well, the feet could look a bit better. So I might get some biotin or well, the feet could look a bit better. Well, I might there. Yeah, that's a B12 complex. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. That somebody's told me that that sounds pretty good. There's there's various formulas that are out there that that, that and I'm not going to mention any names. I might do in my training program, but I'm not going to do it out here in the public. But they're all out there. They are all out there, formulated to have a high content of, of certain nutrients. That is what supplements are. They are formulated to have a high content of certain nutrients in order to provide this <clears throat> balanced diet when combined with other feeds. Balanced. If ever there was a buzzword that I wish was never invented, that has probably got to be one of the ones balanced diet a balancer can you please write in the comments what you think a balancer is and what you think a balanced diet is tell me what about people at our workshops often say i feed a balancer i feed a balancer balancers they didn't even have that word 15 years ago nobody knew what that was but now horses were surviving <laughs> back then 15 years ago horses were didn't just just didn't here on this earth 15 years ago 15 years ago horses were surviving and they didn't have balancers now they have balancers 
what is a balancer. You tell me what a balancer is. Okay. Karen Karen Gray says balanced. I can't I can't pronounce that word. It's rude. Um, Patty Sandow says vitamin and mineral supplement. Pam says that's cool. Alison says a way to make money for feed companies. Well, wow. oh dear, oh dear. I told you this was going to be the controversial bit, and I told you that there will be people watching this in the audience who will be meatloaf people. There will be that you'll be there. Uh, Jeanette says never fed a balance. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> Jeanette then close your ears because you don't want to know just in case it might make you want to feed it um jilly jill says jilly says the vet insisted i gave a balancer if only giving hay no! <laughs> <laughs> tonya says balancer adding something that is supposed to be missing from what you are feeding if you feed correctly you do not need a balancer do you know what i love it hoofing marvelous have been bashing this subject for years and years and finally we are getting people responding on our posts that are just saying the most beautiful things just like tonya just said it's amazing karen gray haha their opinion of a bit of everything yes and jackie says everyone will tell you that you're not feeding them enough with just hay but be strong as you know best they're against us i'm telling you now they're against us as hoof care professionals, my God, we see thousands of feet, right? Now, the feet are the window to the soul. We don't just deal with feet. We deal with all the rest of it, too. But the feet are the window to the soul. People have no clue what they think looks like a decently healthy foot. They don't. Barefoot or shot, they don't know what healthy looks like. And when we come along and we go, change this, take that away, remove this, save yourself some money, do what we say. Believe me, it's simple. It's easy. You just got to find the hay. They go, oh, my God, this is amazing. It actually works. There are two different types of supplements. We can have the synthetic and we can have the natural. We can have uh, synthetic su uh, supplements, which are powders, their lotions, their pellets. And those are the majority, and they are synthetic. The majority of them are. Some are, mi some are a mixture, actually, of synthetic and natural. And then we get the natural ingredients. We get the herbs, and we get nice-smelling herbs and those sorts of things. And we can get the ones that have been GMO'd. So they have been the ones that have been gem gem genetically modified. And then we get the ones that are organic or that are GMO-free. We've got loads of buzzwords going on here. And what we like to feed ourselves, I don't know about you, I can't always afford the bio stuff when I go to the supermarket or bio, as we call it in France, organic, um, but I try and buy it as often as I can. I know that if you go down the organic route with your horses, it's going to cost you an awful lot more money. And I've got something that's more organic than anything else. That's Right. Were you just, whispering then, Lindsay? I couldn't hear you. I was just... I said it's hey, it's all good. They didn't hear me, I don't think. Or just it whispered, whisper it, hey, it's organic. Right. Okay. What an equine supplement is not, and this is important, guys. What it definitely is. Well, you tell me. What is this, an equine? Uh, as Chris, Christus said about selenium. I'm going to pick up on that in a minute, Gary. Don't let me forget. Okay. Um, uh, Michelle says, what about high performance horses? Do they need a bit more hard feet? Oh, I wish we could go into this in so much more detail. Depends what you term high performance. Depends what people term hard work. That we will look at again in a moment. Um, feeding four horses healthy hoof winter balancer for years. Mm -hmm. A man's in the cost of diet to doubled in the last year. Please, unless your vet has studied nutrition extensively, I would be suspect of their advice. Synthetics is mm -hmm, flax, turmeric. Oh my goodness. Now, I'm going to ask you an, uh, what an equine supplement is not. Park that for just one moment because I've just thought of something else to ask you. How many people here right now that have been into horses for quite some time, years, some of you, how many of you have changed supplements and feeds? How many of you are just feeding the same supplement? Well, it probably wasn't around 20 years ago. Or the same feed and you've never changed. 
or how many of you right now have changed and you've either changed because you felt that the what you were giving your horse wasn't doing them any good or you changed because your friend is 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 feeding that or you changed because it sounded more natural or you changed because it wasn't as expensive or some people change because it's more expensive and they want to feed something that's more expensive tell me how many times you have changed your feed your bagged feeds and your supplements over the years how many different companies have you patronized over the years how many different feed companies and different supplement companies have you patronized over the years okay amanda yes gina many pam six or seven yes says zara um adela don't feed anybody i did change a bit when i did feed two two i rest my case I have changed in the past due to pressure, but now I have the basics. Uh, five, says Amanda. I, I changed soon after getting them as I learned to feed better. Went right to hay, changed once. I have fed Thunderbrook's feed for around five years before that. I fed straights. If I actually said to you now, listen, I'm not going to ask you to do it because I don't. we don't want to go down that route. But if I said to you now, list a bunch of feed companies, list a bunch of supplement companies, you'd be at it like a rat up a drain pipe. You would be literally belting them out. They'd be a list. You'd know them all. We know them all. We've heard them all. We've seen every single type of product there is out there. Many of them are actually quite similar. Let's go back to what an equine supplement is not. An equine supplement is not a medicine, people. How many people are feeding supplements because they have been told or they think that it is a treatment, that it is a cure? How many people are doing that? How many people are feeding it because they feel it is a medicine of some sort? Manufacturers, manufacturers, and you need to know this is very important, are not allowed to claim to treat or prevent disease. They're not allowed. Gary, do they still do it? Unfortunately, yes. Their marketing often implies that their supplement actually might be treating or preventing or curing something, a disease or a problem. But let me tell you, it is not allowed. There is a big dividing line between supplements and drugs. With drugs, you have to have research. It has to be tested. It has to be, uh, when requested, you can read it. You can see what they've done. You can see the research they did on the horses that they did it on. And many of the researches that they do do it on aren't necessarily horses and they aren't necessarily horses that obviously are kept naturally. That's drugs for you. Whole different loads of regulations. You have to research it. You have to have data. You're not allowed to put a drug onto the marketplace unless you spent a lot of money on this part, which is the research part. Let's go to supplements. All supplements all bag feeds, every single one of them that is on the market today does not da, 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 need any research whatsoever. None. That lovely word anecdotal, which I like anecdotal. I do like the word anecdotal because there are an awful lot of anecdotes that we could tell you about horses recovering that have been taken off the hypernutrition and the hyper supplementation. We could tell you an awful lot of those anecdotes, but there is an awful lot of anecdotes that will tell you that horses need, 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 need. We have an obesity epidemic. We don't have the opposite. It is actually quite rare. Now you will be told this is not true. I'm telling you it's true because I've seen many thousands of horses. I've experienced many thousands of horses in the magazine across the world and in the jobs that we do. And the amount of people that are in our organization amounts to thousands of hours and thousands of horses. And do you know what we see more often than not is horses having too much. It is rare, really, really rare that you see a horse suffering from lack of a specific nutrient. Oh, it happens. 
It does happen. I'm not here to tell you tonight that it doesn't happen. But of all the horses in the world that are actually lacking in something that they need, one supplement company, one pharmaceutical company, because they're doing it too, could could manage to provide the supplements for that, for those number of horses. If you take a look out there and you do a, a search on Google, there are literally thousands everywhere. And that rules and regulations, they're there. There are rules and there are regulations. They, are put, they have been put in place, but they come down below drugs. And depending on the animal that you're feeding it to, horses actually come quite a lot lower down the chain than cats and dogs, to be fair. But anyway, they come lower down than drugs, the rules and regulations. It goes down a step further. If that animal is not going into the food chain, if it is going into the food chain, we've got a bunch more regulations. Let's go down a step further. The animal that you've got is a pet. It's not going into the food chain. And if it dies, it dies. It's no great big shakes to anybody other than, of course, you and your lovely, beloved animal. So the regulations that regulate this bit here, they're there. But are they enforced? And are they very strict? No, they might as well be practically non-existence. As long as they are grass. Do you know what grass means, folks? What does grass mean? G-R-A-S. And this is an acronym that was created by the FDA, the, 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 um, the Department of, of, of um, Food and Agriculture in, in America. The FDA, they produced this acronym, GRASS, and they did it for the supplement industry, not just for animal supplements, but also for human supplements. What does GRASS mean? G-R-A-S. <clears throat> Yeah, Shannon's in there. Generally, well done, generally recognized as safe. As long as it is grass, you're okay. You're okay. As long as it is grass, as long as it is generally recognized as safe, you can do what you jolly well like. And in fact, every single one of you in this webinar right now could go and produce your own supplement because nobody's going to stop you. Nobody. You could produce your own supplement, stick it in a bag and tell people that it does a very quite a, a, a number of things. Remember, don't say that it doesn't treat. Remember not to say cure and remember not to say um, that it that that it's it's a it's a medicine in any way. You're not allowed to say that, although you will find and I could tell you them, but I'm not going to because that would be naughty. But there are products on the market that say that they cure things. And that's not actually strictly legal. So as long as it's grass and it's generally recognized as safe, away you go. So, Gary, we are going to produce our own supplement. It's a new scientific formula and it's going to be called Trust Your Gut. It's going to be called Trust Your Gut, and it's it's a it's a very special magic formula. And I, and there's my little my little uh, cauldron, top left hand corner, where I've been making this magic formula. And I am going to feed this to my animals because it's going to improve their gut, even though it's called Trust Your Gut. And I don't really trust my gut. I don't trust my horse's gut either. So we're going to produce this. Do you reckon people would buy it? Yeah. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. especially, especially, oh, excuse me, dog. Get off. Especially um, with all the knowledge that we have, we could blind you with science and we could tell you this is what you want to feed. We could, we could. Dang it. Mine are like the bicarb book at the moment. Inter Pardon? We're not going to, though. No, we're not going to. Because we don't need to. That is me doing my supplement talk. You, of course, can go out there and feed as many supplements as you like. But if you don't know why you're feeding them or if you have been told you have to feed them because it's going to stop this behavior or that behavior, then let me tell you, company, pay 24 7, 365, water, 
and a salt block, not in a bucket, mineral salt block. And yes, they can lick them. And yes, they can get enough if they need it. You just put those to your horse and all your problems will melt away. All of them will just start to melt away. And with that, we need to finish very quickly, Gary, because we've done far too much. What is the best way to feed your horse? Now, not everybody can do this. And this is this. No. You, you have to do what you can do. But what you mustn't do if you can't do this is still hyper supplement, hyper nutrition. Take it away, Gary. OK, so um, I was having a wee chat with um, a few people um, while uh, th through the Q&A um, on Zoom. Um, whilst Lindsay was going through the carbohydrates. Um, I, I have to say, the, the, these ladies must be able to multitask way better than me. <laughs> um, so we, we, the, uh, the, there's this particular scenario that I'm going to use, which is gonna really help uh, with, with the, the, the end of this presentation. Um, a lady's got a number of horses with specific, um, specific needs. Um, one of them, which is particularly laminitic, one's got EMS, one's absolutely fine, and 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 so on and so on. Um, so it's 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 not um, uh, it's not uncommon to then have those horses kept very separately and to their specific ways, if it is at all possible. If you can set up a track system um, uh, uh, or um, otherwise known as a paddock paradise, um, those in America will probably be um, familiar with it. Um, uh, in the UK, the, people don't tend to like the paddock paradise name as such. So um, we just call it track systems. Now, this track system that you're looking at right now started off with just being a track around the outside of the field. Um, and hay was put into um, various locations. Um, and there was a little bit of hardcore, but um, not much. Um, and the rest was just on the ground. The grass didn't really grow because the horse traveled on that track all the way around the outside. And the hay was put out. They always had access to clean water. They always had access to uh, salt and mineral block. And they did very well, thank you very much. And when we're talking about laminitics and laminitis, the one thing that can, can really be a big game changer for that is to stop the sugar. And to stop the sugar, particularly if you're living in the UK or in, in Europe, when the, the, the grass and the lowland grasslands are low, sweet for a lot of times in the year, this is a really good way. And, it, and it's, a, it's a relatively easy way to manage that. The track needs to be not dead ended. So there's always somewhere for the horse to go. Because I'm sure you've seen on um, in, in, when you've been traveling around into the new forest, um, uh, Dartmoor, Exmoor, or even if you're further afield in the American Great Basin and um, horses travel on tracks. That is their safe zone. They might wander off the tracks to forage, but if something startles them, the first thing that they go to is the track because it's a known safe route. So all we're doing is mimicking that to a degree and giving them that healthy forage as they go around. Now, it doesn't matter whether you've got a fatty, um, a, a skinny, a laminitic, an EMS, when they've all got friends, they've all got freedom, and they've all got forage, what a horse needs. It's their basic requirement. No, not everybody is gonna be able to do this. I, 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 I'm a realist. Some people that are on livery yards, um, this may be problematic. Um, but there will be things that have been said in this, um, this webinar that changes that you can make, which will make it a positive for your horse, for sure. Um, and do what you can. 
that that's 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 what we're on about do what you can now as this the in this picture that we're we're looking at right now um as the horses increased so did the the the, the track had to increase because we needed to make more movement um so then it was basically um concentric circles but where but every single horse had access to all of the track so that it wasn't track one track two and track three yes it was but every horse had access to all three of those tracks so can you imagine how long that track is now this track was in um, around about three acres so all of those horses had these tracks and in those tracks i have to say there was zero grass because those horses moved and because they're constantly moving on that grass the grass didn't grow but you, to do that you've got to have a lot of horses if you've got less horses then you need a a, a shorter narrower track so don't think you're going to have two horses and then you're going to stick a track up around five acres because there would still be too much grass um so this is quite an elaborate picture um let's have a look at uh, the next one Linz. oh sorry i was just that's typing okay. away and typing away in the chat that's okay um so this is something that's a bit a little bit more simple you've got a field shelter you can see the green splodges and um, there's water um there's a hay store um and it's a basic around the outside but not only do we want to manage their diet which is what track systems are all about we also want to give them environment enrichment don't we because we don't want them just traveling and eating if there's hedgerows nearby um that they can nibble on that's great if you've got some fallen trees you can put that across the track so they can actually scratch or step over it the options are endless these horses are so clever these sorry these horses are so clever um that they can they need stuff to do with each other and as soon as something changes i had a client that's got um, their horses on a track the other day and they were um they had a little digger in and they were clearing out their compost heap and they stuck it on the the concrete yard um, in front of a field shelter that's part of the track and they said it was absolutely amazing because these horses were playing on this mound for days they were sticking their nose in it, they were pouring at it, they were climbing up it. The little Shetlands were going on the top because that's the first time that their eye level had been level with the big horses. Um, uh, oh, it was anything like that. Environment enrichment, tracks aren't just about being able to provide a species specific diet. It's a, it's a, and you're, you can go, wild with your imagination is there anything else Linz? is there another picture or no I that's done? it we're done. Oh, is it done i was just okay, typing cool. away like mad i was just typing away like mad it was your turn <laughs> there, there was so much there was there's so much to tell you about it um, there is, there and is. like gary gary said also um he said at the beginning there if you can't do this you can't right but that doesn't mean no. to say that you should overload your horse with all the other stuff you just go and source the, the the hay and if you are at a certain and i know it's like oh lindsay says just go and source it it's not that easy well no it isn't it is actually the one thing that becomes the really biggest bugbear of all um but it's getting better because as more owners put more pressure on farmers to produce go back to the what it was like after the war before the rye really kicked off or before the war, when we had meadow and horses were fed meadow um they didn't have half as many problems. Oh, we've still had laminitis, but that's been around for a very long time because when horses are, are, are kept confined in paddocks and fed grass, they're going to get inflammatory processes going on in their body for all of the reasons I explained earlier when it came to carbohydrates. But you can 
most definitely help your horse by taking out of the diet rather than putting in. And if your livery yard or your barn has a yard owner who is not um, um, receptive to you having a pit of scrub land where you can keep your horses out 24 seven on a little track, or they won't let you feed hay, or they're insistent on you on you feeding their haylage or their rileage, then you have to make choices. And that's the hard part about it is you have to make the choice. It's the horse or the yard, because at some point it will catch up with you. You'll get hoof problems. You'll have hoof cracks. You'll have white line disease. You'll get abscesses. You may even have to go to shoes because your horse is footy when, of course, you don't because then you're just putting a plaster on it and just pretending. These are warning signs, guys. Ripples in the hoof wall, blood spots. Go back and watch our other webinars, particularly the one on laminitis. Don't think that your horse isn't having inflammatory processes just because it's not leaning back in the laminitis stance. That's when it's acute, when it's chronic. Oh. Gary. We've done it to death. We've been on two hours. So we hope you enjoyed it. Yes. We hope you enjoyed your evening or your day with us or your afternoon with us or your lunchtime with us. We, I don't know. I can't remember what's coming up next. Somebody go onto the website now and tell us what's coming up next because I can't remember. Go and visit schoolhmi.com. Go to the webinar page. Have a look. Tell me what's coming up next because I can't remember. Stay tuned. Oh, actually, I might be able to read it from that. No, no, I'm Sunday 9th of April, 23rd. Oh, the next one is how to prevent navicular in your horse without metal shoes. And that's on Sunday, the 14th of May, guys. Woo! That's what we're going to be talking about next. We're going to be talking about that little navicular bone, that little jigger there that's caused all those problems. So make sure you stay tuned. But as promised. For those of you who've stayed right to the bitter end and none of you have dropped out, I think we've had like two come and go. You've all stayed firm and you've stayed firm because you want the deal. I know you do. I know you do because you don't want the people who are going to watch the recording to get the deal. They're not allowed to get the deal because they didn't make the effort that you did to come here. And for future people that are watching the recording, I love you too. And I know you probably couldn't help it and you couldn't watch it live like everybody else but try and make it live next time because every time we do one of these webinars we're gonna give something away every time right do you remember what the giveaway was gary bog off pardon he just told me to bog off did you hear that that's how <laughs> rude how very rude it's a bog off offer you get one of the ebooks. I've got it the wrong way around. You get title two and you get title one free. Okay. How to go successfully barefoot with your horse is eight chapters of stunningly amazing information. It covers the essentials for both barefoot horse owners and those wanting to go barefoot. So if you're shoeing, make sure your friend who's shoeing reads it. They need to read it. And you will get free with that. Title one, which is understanding your horse's hoof. It looks at the common issues with the horse's hoof and how to recognize them. So now I've confused you because it says it's one way around. It should be the other way around. Hang on. I know it's going to let me just hang on. Oh, no, it's the wrong bit. Hang on. Let me just move the free bit. Let's get hold of the arrow. Get off. Get, get off. <laughs> Let's get hold of the arrow and let's this is live visit. editing this as, is live as, editing, live editing. <laughs> boom that's what you get free you buy that one on the right go, go and buy how to success to go successfully barefoot with your horse and you and it's only was it 9.99 sundra tenner that's 10 pounds so i don't know whatever the equivalent is in your currency you'll you, there's a currency converter thing and it's a bog off so you get buy one get one free they're brilliant the other one, Understanding Your Horse's Hoof, is five chapters. Honestly, it'll make a massive difference and we cover some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. And in order for you to do that, you need something very special. What is that thing that they need that is very special, Gary? It is a... It's a bog off code. It's a bog off. You just like saying bog off. <laughs> there it is. E -bo -bog off. It's an e-book bog off. 
go and get your ebook but if you put that code in in actual fact i think i might have done it where it might just pop up in your car and i need to go and change that because we don't want everybody getting it make sure that you've there, there's a little place there in the in the view cart bit on the checkout where you can put ebook bug off in there ebook bug off ebook bug off if you put that in automatically you pay for one book we'll give you the other one free it'll just go boom and when you get your um oh, oh i don't know your your confirmation email look on the confirmation email and the link to the ebook pdf is right there and then you can go and read it because it's awesome they're amazing there's the website for pam only pam's gonna go it's only pam gary she's the only one that's gonna go because she's the one that knows where it is the website is there that's what you're looking for schoolhmi.com go and please read those ebooks because it will back up everything we've said tonight and it will help you and your horse Okay, everybody's, there's people leaving now. They're rushing over to the website to buy it. Bog off, bog off. And I'm just seeing payments coming in. Ebook bog off. There you go. Thank you very much. We love you all. You're the best. Many, 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 many thanks. We love you. Woo, it was amazing. See you next you, time. You have to have the responsibility to look after your horse. It's your responsibility. It's not your vets or your farriers or your trimmers or your friends or your mum and your dad, or your granny, or your auntie. It's your responsibility, isn't it, Gary? You empower to yourself. That, empower empower yourself. You, if you want to look after a specialist animal, then do it right. And then you'll get wonderful, wonderful things from them. Okay? Ah, thanks, Susie. Thank you so much. This was awesome. How long do we get the bog of? Oh, Tonya, good question. Uh, what time is it now? It's 10 past 10. You have got, how many hours should we give them? Because some people might be at work and it might be lunchtime. You have got until tomorrow morning hour time. So I'm going to give you 12 hours. 12 hours to get your bog off. And if you've not got your bog off in 12 hours, it's bogging off. <laughs> the bog off is bogging off. You've got 12 hours. And I promise you, I won't send out this recording to everybody until 12 hours is up. Once 12 hours is up, the recording goes out and all you lovely people that are watching it recorded, come back to see us in a live show. Well, somebody's asking what course do they come included with? That's the Hoof Uncovered. Oh yes, if um, you buy the Hoof so Uncovered. If, mm -hmm. if, if you want to do the Hoof Uncovered part one and part two, then the eBooks come with them. They do. And, and then you become a student. If you take on any of our courses, the Hoof Uncovered or any other foundation course or anything, you become one of our students. You get into our inner circle. You get into the inner dome where all our students live in the college of the school of horse and hoof care. And that is exciting. But anyway, we're not selling Hoof um, Uncovered also, tonight. Also, just, just as another little plug is, um, when you when you have the hoof, hoof uncovered, um, yes, they're lessons. Yes, they're online, but you you don't watch them once. Well, you can watch them once if you want, um, but if you want to watch them more than once, they're always there for you, forever and forever, ever. forever and ever. So you yeah. can go back and recap and clarify information and so on. It's there forever for you. It's all on the website. Go to the yep. website. Pam knows where it is. If you call, ask Pam, she'll tell you where the website is. Schoolhmi.com. Lovely. We will see you again on whenever it was in May. I'm not going to say the date because I'll get it wrong because I've forgotten it instantly. Um, all about Navicula next, Gary. All about Navicula. Can we talk about navicular for two hours? Oh, my God. oh I can yeah. talk about, honestly, I could talk about dog clipping for two hours. I can talk about anything. I could talk about the color of a bumblebee for two hours. Right, we're off. I need to go and crack on and do even more work and carry on. And Gary does as well. And I'm going to go and eat something because I'm starving. Right. See you later, peeps. We love you. Come back again. Register for more. I'll see you next time. Ta-ra. Bye-bye. Yeah.